to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our study in the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 4 tonight in our verse-by-verse study. Uh, finished up chapter 3 last week and moving on into chapter 4. The plan is, uh, Lord willing, we'll study the first nine verses of this chapter uh, tonight. And then we'll, uh, we'll read it, then we'll come back and uh, pray. Uh, beginning with verse 1 in Proverbs chapter 4, the scripture says, Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee, and she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. So shall, uh, excuse me, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Father, we thank you for your word for its strength and its power, for its perfection, for, its, uh, for the conviction we receive from it, Lord, from the comfort we receive as well, and for the instruction in righteousness. And so we thank you for it and ask that as you open our understanding to it that we would be ready to receive it. And Father, we just thank you for each one who's come tonight for these prayer requests. We pray for each one, Father, that you would intervene in the lives of those who are ill uh, and that you would heal them. And Father, we certainly submit this as a request to you for our desires, yet we submit to your will, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. Okay, um, so I call this intergenerational biblical training. Intergenerational biblical training. Uh, my subtitle it, uh, Sound Teaching is a Family Affair. <laughs> um, you know, too many families leave the teaching of God's Word up to the church um, as they do the teaching of uh, secular education to the school. The home should be the place where they receive primary instruction, particularly biblical instruction in the ways of life. And what we see here is Solomon speaking of his father David and, of course, speaking to his son and that's an intergenerational. We see Solomon there in the first verse, Hear ye children, uh, the instruction of a father. Um, and um, if you look at uh, verse 3, he says, For I was my father's son, and David and Bathsheba is referring to in this verse, For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Um, so we see that instruction that came down to him and that which he gives out. At biblical instruction, it's so critical Family is the core unit. The first institution God created was the family. And, um, and the world's trying to pervert that family unit right now. But God's design is perfect. Um, so we have male and female, and we have children, and the parents in the family not only have the responsibility, but they have the right to train their children and be responsible for that training. Uh, we relinquish some of that training to the school system. We relinquish some of that to the church. Um, but primarily, the family is responsible for the training of the children. And uh, the family means not just the parents and the children, but the grandparents as well. Um, so that's what we'll see in, in, intertwined in the first few verses here. And so I wanted to focus on that because we... We seem to devalue the family as the primary source of biblical training. Um, and it should be, it should be you know, it, it, parents, as they become uh, educated or trained in the Word of God, they should teach it to their children. 
It's an Old Testament principle, and it should be, and it's a New Testament principle. Sound doctrine is that which we all require, and uh, to to forego that responsibility in the family is 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 an omission that God doesn't overlook. Um, and we see a strong sense of biblical training, the, the need for biblical training in the family through these verses uh, here uh, today. So the first couple of verses, I call this, uh, respect the value of wisdom. Now we'll see the th these themes that we study, we'll see them over and over and over again in the book of Proverbs. And that's the point. Uh, we, we remember best by repetitive uh, rote memorization and hearing the same thing over and over and over again. I can liken it to being a baseball player. Uh, and, you know, the coach always told me I was, I was a good infielder. I wasn't the only good infielder. But to be, a, to be a good infielder, you had to start with your glove on the ground and then bring it up. Uh, and it's, it's not a natural response. You have to learn to do that. And I can't tell you how many times I've been told and how many times I've had to remind myself and other people, even over the years. It just, it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's like any sport. Uh, if you're pitching, if you're batting, if you're bowling, if, or if you're basketball shooting, or tennis in your shot, following through is critical. Every one of those. You've got to follow through. And it's a lazy thing, but we have a natural tendency not to do that. Um, and we've got to do it. So biblically, that training needs to, needs to exist in the home, and it needs to be over and over and over again. And we'll hear the same things over and over again in Proverbs, and that's for our edification and for our strengthening spiritually. Um, so these first two verses, respect the value of wisdom. The first two verses, to read them again, hear ye, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. The four tells us why. For I give you good doctrine. There's a pause there. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law, law, if you will, referring to um, biblical and uh, scriptural teaching, if you will. And in fact, the word used there for law is Torah, if you will, that um, means teaching. So uh, in the first verse, uh, the first thing we have to do, the first thing we have to do is listen. The word here means listen, 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 listen. Uh, we've talked recently about having eyes to see and not seeing, about having ears to hear and not hearing. Um, I can't tell you how many times in my education, in all the years that I was in, because I had the, the, the 12 years going up through high school, and then I had another seven years past that. So 19 years of education. I can't tell you how often I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and it, it shows in not picking up a lot of stuff and not learning a lot of stuff like I should have. Uh, but biblically, it's more critical there than anywhere else. And the first word we see here out of the chute is hear. The word means listen. Not only hear, that is to listen, but listening is not the entire essence of our response to the word of God. And I know in Romans chapter 10, it tells us how can we hear without a preacher? So we need to listen. Here we're talking about instruction that's passed down from a parent to a child, from a grandparent to a parent to a child, grandparents to children, to children grandchildren. Uh, but listening is one thing. Uh, the other part of the verse here, it says, and attend to no understanding. The word attend means pay attention. So we can listen and hear it, but unless we're paying attention, uh, then, then it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. And paying attention means this. It means that we have a desire and a hunger to retain, comprehend it, and retain it. To hear it, process it, so that we understand it. And how do we get it? The understanding comes from the Lord. It's a spiritual gift, if, we, if you will, because it's discernment. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what Solomon asked for. He asked for the ability to discern between right and wrong as he judged the people. 
is that discernment. And understanding is that discernment. We'll come across that a little later. But to be able to discern what's right and what's wrong. Because we hear a lot of things today that aren't true. We hear a lot of things today that aren't true. Uh, it's seemingly the, the people in our society that are trying to pervert our nation um, are getting ears that hear and eyes that see what they want and what they promote. Uh, and we've got to be careful uh, because listening is not all of it. Paying attention is not all of it. But it's, it's that comprehension and discernment to know what to reject and what to accept. Here, the focus is on biblical instruction in the family unit. Listen to your father. <laughs> uh, and here, here, we're not talking about just listening to a father, but listening to a godly father who's teaching biblical truth. That's the essence of what we're talking about. That is the crux of where all of us need to be in the home is that that biblical, it's an intergenerational thing. It goes from generation to generation to generation. We've got to take the baton and go on to the next generation where we hand it on, you know, to them. So hear and pay attention. <laughs> so it says, hear the instruction of a father. And this is the father who not only has the, the responsibility as a father to do it, but is required by God to do it. So it's, a, it's not only a right and a privilege to do it, and, you know, we see this thing that's going on in New Jersey. It just absolutely boggles my mind that they want to allow children as early as kindergarten level to make up their own mind whether they change genders or not. And, of course, they're giving them all this, all this per perverted teaching to let them think that it's, it's easy. All you got to do is make up your own mind. And they give them all these things that confuse them, and then they, they get pointed, and then they, the process is they want to get them, whatever you are, change to the other. And 77% of the parents object, because they, what they're doing is they don't even have the responsibility to notify the parents. The children can identify as a different gender. And 77% of the people in the state don't want that. Now, you know, that, and I, I just saw that number today, 77%, but I heard the, the, this thing's been going on for a couple of weeks or longer than that. And there's an issue in the court, and it's, it's a decision being made. But the thing is, do parents have the right uh, to know? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, it's like Mary told me, we were talking about it, and she said, if you want to get an aspirin in school, you've got to have... Um, uh, in school, you got to have parents' permission to be able to receive the aspirin from the school nurse. But you can change your gender without anybody knowing about it. I mean, what is... So 77% of the parents are saying, no, we don't want this. Actually, the adult population in Jersey don't want that. But yet, that's what the government's doing. Tell me that the government is fulfilling the desire of the people. The government is supposed to be, what, doing the will of the people. That's what they get elected for. But even worse than that is the fact that we have 77 from 100 is 23 percent of the people are saying it's far perfectly fine. And in fact, it should be that way that the parents don't even know that they change genders. And the reason they say that is because that protects the LGBTQ plus community. It protects all those people. Now, you know, we're talking about biblical truth here. And I just gave an example of horrible perversion of the truth that is being forced on the people that don't want it. And the parents, even though they have a God-given right to manage their children, the state's taking it away. They're taking it away. Because in what's happening in these scenarios, when they take that privilege, when they take that a uh, re requirement to notify parents that it's going on, when they take that away, then what, what can a parent do? They can't even protest it. You know, and it's just going to go downhill. Once they get that, they can get anything they want, and they can pervert everything. But, you know, if we hear the Word of God and we pay attention to the Word of God, we're going to know the truth. And the truth will do what? It will set us free. <laughs> Set us free from this perversion, free from 
sin and, and, and the sin nature in the sense that we now have the truth that we can operate on even though we're still living in the flesh. So we're free, if you will, through the Word of God. And so Solomon's teaching his children here uh, that the instruction of a father and of the mother in, the, um, in verse 3, uh, that it's paramount that the children listen and pay attention to them. That is to comprehend and digest it and to apply it in their life. Because training that isn't practiced uh, is not going to stick. Not going to stick. We always use that phrase in, uh, in business as we train people. You know, but it's practice, it's practice that makes training stick. And that is that, that you're able to do it. So if you, if you tell somebody and you don't require the children to live their lives in accordance with it, you can tell them the truth. But then when a question comes up, Mom, can I go see this movie? Yeah, you can go see that. It's fine. And that movie contradicts the truth of the scriptures. What are you doing? We're, we're being hypocrites to our children. So the instruction to a child first has to be lived by the parents and then enforced by the parents. And so we have a requirement to enforce that. Um, so we're here we're talking about comprehension. To listen, pay attention, to comprehend. And, and comprehend, the word attend there, comes with it the connotation of effort. Effort. We've got to put effort into it. Uh, I know when I studied difficult subjects, when I had to read and, and things that are difficult to comprehend, you read it once and you go back and you read it again. And each time you read it, it becomes a little clearer. You understand a little more. What does that require? It requires effort. That's why I say simple reading of the scriptures won't get you to spiritual strength. It won't get you there. Just reading, got to study, got to study. And it takes effort. It means going over it and over it until you understand it. Who is it that's going to give us the ability to understand the word? The Holy Spirit. He leads and guides us into all truth. Um, so, in verse 1 there, uh, children are to listen and pay attention, comprehend, if you will. And then in verse 2, the reason is because the parent here, uh, who is Solomon, is given good doctrine. Good doctrine. That's sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. The word sound means whole. Uh, it means it's not perverted. Uh, the world today is trying to pervert the truth uh, because there's only one absolute truth and it's the Word of God. Everything else is a lie according to the Scriptures. But just take a, a, a moment. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 uh, where Paul instructs this young pastor, Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. Right out of the chute when he writes his first letter to Timothy... Uh, to instruct him uh, as, as a good mentor should um, to his protege, Timothy. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, the scripture says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. That's Paul, uh, because he left Timothy at Ephesus to pastor the church there. And uh, that church was near and dear to Paul who spent two or three years there. He said, as I besought thee um, to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou what? He left Timothy there to do what? That thou might, um, mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. No other teaching. The word doctrine means teaching. Teach no other teaching. So teaching that is contrary to the word of God is perversion of the truth. And it's like Paul wrote to the church at Galatia in the first chapter and told the Galatia, the churches at Galatia, I am just shocked that you're so soon removed from the gospel, the true gospel, unto another gospel. That is a gospel which isn't the gospel, but it's, it's teaching of a different kind. Um, but So he warns Timothy here not to teach any other doctrine. Look at verse 8 in chapter 1. He says, but we know that the law... And this is the word of God is, is good. The word of the law is good. And if a man use it lawfully, um, and then if he use it lawfully, and then if you look, uh, verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for a lawless and disobedient, for the, un, um, uh, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, or for manslayers, um, for literally fornicators here, for them that defile themselves with mankind, um, and for essentially kidnappers, liars, perjured persons, etc. So verse 11, according 
to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The end of verse 10 says, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is so utterly important. And we're going to see in our lesson tonight, it takes primacy, preeminence in our life. Uh, it's nothing to fool around with. It's a certain responsibility. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 13. This is Paul teaching the young pastor Timothy as he was pastoring the church at Ephesus there. And he says in chapter 4 and verse 13 to him, he says, Till I come, as he had gone away, till I come, give attendance. There's that attendance, if you will, to attend to, we see in, in Proverbs. Till I come, give attendance to what? To reading to exhortation, to doctrine. Um, and then in verse 15, it says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy um, uh, profiting may appear to all. Take heed. And by the way, that, that thy profiting may appear to all. We're going to see that in our lesson tonight, as uh, that if we embrace and cherish uh, wisdom, it will promote us. And this is that promotion that, that Paul's talking about here. You meditate on these scriptures. You're going to be studying them. You're going to be teaching them. You're not going to be teaching anything else but the truth. It says that um, you give yourself wholly to them. Thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, that is, um, of, of the Lord. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear you. And, of course, saving yourself is from the false teachers that were encountered in the first part of this book. And you'll save others from being influenced and captured, if you will, by the false teaching that's prevailing there in Ephesus. So, um, you know, false teaching was prominent there. And you know what? Paul said it's going to wax worse and worse. So false teaching today is more prominent than it was in those days. It's just better disguised because they wax worse and worse. And, and the people who are doing it are cl more clever, if you will. And, you know, we're no match for the devil. We're no match for the devil. So we go into a church and we listen to a preacher, we on the radio or watch a television uh, broadcast, and somebody's teaching the Word of God, uh, it's us and them. And what makes the difference in being able to understand whether or not that's true or not? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit within us. He leads and guides us into the truth, and He'll warn us of those things that are contrary to the, but, but the devil, we're no match for the devil. So those people are teaching false doctrine as they have always been. They transform themselves into the ministers of Satan, okay, or they've transformed themselves to the ministers of God, but they're truly the ministers of Satan. They look like ministers of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they look like the ministers of God, but they're not. They're actually working for Satan. Those Pharisees and scribes, uh, they thought that they were the children of God. Jesus told them they're children of the devil. So there are people serving the devil. They think they're serving God. And what happens is people who are following them are serving the devil too. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to give us that discernment whether or not the teaching is good or not. Um, so we go back to our text in Proverbs. And we could go on. There's a, a number of verses over there in 2 Timothy, over in Titus as well, that speak the same thing about sound doctrine. Um, so we go back to Proverbs uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, um, where uh, Solomon speaks to his child and says, For I give you good doctrine. Good doctrine. That's sound doctrine. Um, and he says, uh, and, and so knowing that that's what he's teaching his children, that's what we should be teaching our children. Now you say, well, I don't teach I don't teach Bible to my children or my grandchildren. Uh, well, why not? Because you don't have to have a Bible open before you to do it. You can teach biblical principles as you live day by day. As you encounter them in your life, you, can, you have discernment to know what's right or wrong. You can give them that discernment and tell them how to, to choose the difference. Um, and we can't save them, but we can point them in the right direction. Train them in the way they should go. We'll encounter that later in the scripture. Train them in the way they should go. And when they get old, they'll not depart from it. So we can have that kind of influence on our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. So in Proverbs 4.2, I give you good doctrine. So the issue here that he gives to his children is, Forsake ye not my law. 
The teaching that I give you is good teaching. It's good doctrine. Don't forsake it. That means don't disregard it. Don't turn away from it. Don't refuse it. Don't reject it. Don't, you know, just, just don't do anything except accept it, right? To receive it. And it's sort of like verse 1 says, listen and pay attention <laughs> to, the good, to the good doctrine in verse 2. So in verse 3 and 4, uh, I said the first part there was respect the value of wisdom. In the next two verses, retain wisdom. Respect the value of it and then retain it. Verse 3, for I, was in my, uh, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. And he's talking here about David and Bathsheba. He wasn't the only child, but he was a child of them. And he was considered to be tender and beloved. And, uh, and he brings his mother in here, that not only his father, but his mother as well, cared for him and cared for him in a biblical way. And they, he received that instruction in the home. So in verse 4, he taught me also, that is David taught Solomon, he taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. I put retain wisdom. So David told Solomon as recorded here, he told me and said this. First thing that he, that he, that he recalls being said to him is let your heart by the word, the word let is a command. It's a command. Retain God's word. Retain God's word. Uh, retain means to keep it. Uh, don't let go of it. Uh, it, even, it even has the connotation of possessing it. If, you, if, you, if somebody gives you a, a gift and you take it and you keep it, you retain it, it's yours. You own it. It's your possession. And so retaining the wisdom, it becomes your own. Uh, we literally possess the wisdom of God, if you will, because as a child of God, the Holy Spirit is within us, and God's Word is within us. Why? Because Christ is in us. Christ is in us. And if you look at Colossians 3.16 for a second, um, it's, it's always, for me, a good reminder to go check this verse because it's not just the fact that you retain the Word of God, but it's how you retain it. Because you can remember John 3.16, for God so loved the world, um, etc. You can, you can retain that and have that knowledge, but what does that really mean? Uh, because he loved us so much, he loved the world, right? That he gave his only begotten son, Christ, that he sent him to the cross to pay the price for our sins, which is blood. Uh, and there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And it's not just any blood. The blood of the animals wasn't sufficient in the Old Testament except temporarily as substitutionary measure. But when Jesus Christ came, the Son of God, because God gave him to us, to the world, that we might have everlasting life through him, and he shed his blood, we, get, we put our faith in him, we have everlasting life. And that's a possession. But look at Colossians 3.16. Talking about the word here. Because sound doctrine is what was being taught. And Paul writes to the church at Colossae and says this. Profound principle here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, the word of Christ. We know what that is. We, Christ is dwelling in us. The Holy Spirit's dwelling in us. And as we, as we retain the Word of God, that is dwelling in us. But it dwells in us through Christ, because when we get saved, Christ dwells with us as well as the Holy Spirit. But let the Word of Christ dwell in you. The word dwell means to abide. And it, it has the connotation to mean that you, you allow the Word of God to feel at home in your life like a dear guest. You know, the, think of the most, the, the, um, the most esteemed guest you might have and how you might treat them when they come in your house. And maybe it'd be a relative or a real close friend. And you say, my house is your house. I mean, how many times have I said that? I said, people come in. I said, well, it, you know, it, it's your house too. Just come in, make yourself at home. And if there's anything you need, let me know. If you can't find it, uh, you're welcome to search for it. If you can't find it, let me know. And if we don't have it, I'll let you know. If we have it, you're entitled to it. 
but you know that's sort of abiding in your house, living in your house. And we've had house guests that have lived there for long periods of time, and that's good. Even even when our kids were an early age, some of their friends live with us. Always welcome people in our home. So we have this. This is a welcoming somebody in your house, and that's the analogy here: is that they would dwell in you. That is, the word is going to be welcomed in your heart, right? Let the word of Christ dwell in you. So you are the house of the word of God living in you, and that word is welcome. That means that we're going to get along real well, and whatever the word says, that's what we're going to do. But it says, let it dwell in you richly. The word richly means abundantly, abundantly. Let the word of God dwell in you abundantly. What does it mean for the word of God to dwell in you abundantly? If John 3, 16 is the only verse you know, it's not abundantly dwelling in you. <laughs> and if you've got a few favorite verses and you love those, you memorize those, the word of God's not dwelling in you abundantly. How does the word of God dwell in us abundantly? When we read and study and we give ourselves wholly, we're going to see that in our study further tonight, we give ourselves wholly to the word of God because we give ourselves wholly to God then we have given ourselves to God's Word because it's through God's Word that we know who God is and what He expects of us. And so we literally not only uh, totally surrender to Him, but we're subject, we're subject to Him that whatever His beck and call is, that's what we want to do. <clears throat> so the Word of Christ dwelling us in abundantly means that whatever the Word says, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it with open arms as a welcome guest in our house. And whatever the word says, we're gonna go along with that. Um, and we're not gonna enforce our will over God's will. We're not gonna pretend that we don't know God's will and go on our own. <clears throat> but I wanted to focus on that first part of the verse and we see the value of that, if you will, in reaching out to each other as believers in fellowship and how that we build spiritual strength together. But that comes from letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. So we go back, the word of Christ, because the word, Christ is the word, the word is God. And so we go back to Proverbs 4, when it talks about good doctrine, when it talks about the word of God, we understand, and that's what I'm talking about in verse 4. It says, He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words. It's really that dwelling in us abundantly. That's letting, that's letting your heart retain the word of God. And then <clears throat> if that is happening, and this is a command to, to that, that, the, that uh, the word is retained within us, but not only that, but that we're obedient to it. It says, keep my commandments. The word keep means to obey. So we're going to let the word be, dwell in us abundantly. We're going to continue to meditate and study. It's a, it's a constant lifelong process until the day the Lord takes us home. And, and then what we're going to do is we're going to obey what God says. And it says the, the, the profit we get and live. And so what does that mean to live there? Well, we're already alive. So it doesn't refer to actually living on top side of earth. Because we had to do that in order for the Word of God to, to reach us, right? But to live, it means live a life of obedience to God. Live a life that counts for God. Live a life that glorifies God. Live a life that God is pleased with. And whatsoever thing we do, do all for the glory of God. That's what it means. And then, <clears throat> when the Word of God is dwelling in us richly, and <clears throat> when uh, as it is retained, we're obedient to the Word of God, we're going to live. We're going to live for God. We're going to live for God. Because living for ourselves is a very selfish thing, isn't it? We just live for ourselves. God saves us from ourselves because, you know, we were, we were in self-righteous condition when God saved us. But now we've given control over to Him. So if we're controlled by the word that we retain and obey, <clears throat> we're going to live a life that will glorify God. <clears throat> so I'll call this retain wisdom. It's a duty and an obligation for every believer to do that. And it's a duty and responsibility for parents to impose instruction on their children, biblical instruction, so that they can live a life that's, um, that's, that will glorify God. And this is given in a command form. And so it is a command. So then we go to verse 5 to the rest of the chapter, and I call this render wisdom preeminent. 
And I use a sense in rendering. Rendering means to make something. You get a bunch of ingredients in the kitchen together and you render a cake. You make a cake. You make it become a cake, right? So to render it. Render, if you will, um, wisdom to be preeminent. So we have to make it that way in our life because it's not naturally preeminent in our life. It doesn't naturally take primacy in our life. First place we're talking about. Not naturally. We have to surrender ourselves and give ourselves up and, and retain God's word and be obedient to God's word. And then, if you will, when we embrace it, and we're going to see that here, when we embrace that and love the word of God and cherish it so that it is preeminent, it's a position that we take, that it's preeminent in our life, then, boy, I tell you what, uh, you start moving mountains, as the scripture says. And moving mountains doesn't mean that we move obstacles in our life that we want to get rid of. It means that we'll be able to do great things for the Lord according to His will, regardless of the cost to ourselves. <clears throat> we're always looking, or we're most often looking for things that, you know, will benefit us. But we want things that will benefit the Lord and His uh, testimony in the world through us. <clears throat> so, in verse 5, you get a couple of get statements here. Get. Get it, get it. Get what? This is a command. Get wisdom. Get it. <laughs> um, you know, if um, it's like uh, a, a child doesn't have a job, and you tell your child, go out and get a job. They made a song out of that one time, Get a Job, right? <laughs> I can't sing. But it was a song called Get a Job, right? But you tell your kids, go out and get a job, right? Well, the Lord tells us to get wisdom. We need to get it. How do we get it? How do we get it? Remember James chapter 1? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Prayer. And he giveth liberally and upbraideth not. He giveth liberally. We ask. God responds by just showering the blessings of understanding on us. But we need to get wisdom, get understanding. And when you, typically when you see wisdom and then understanding, uh, like you see here, and you see the same thing in verse 7, where it says at the middle of the verse, get wisdom, and if I get in, get understanding. So get wisdom, get understanding. It's repeated here. Get wisdom, get understanding. It's what Solomon had been looking for. He wanted to get wisdom so that he'd be able to do what? He would discern right and wrong and be able to judge the people. So that understanding with wisdom is get the wisdom, the knowledge, and, and then the ability through that knowledge to be able to determine what's right and what's wrong in all facets of life. So get wisdom and get understanding, and they are requirements. We need to acquire it, we need to receive it, um, and we need to possess it for God's glory. So get wisdom, get understanding. Oh, by the way, um, that little phrase there, forget it not. <laughs> and why is that in there? You know, the Hebrew children, when, when, when they failed miserably, God picked them back up, blessed them, even though they didn't deserve it. And then, oh, they were so glad God did that for them. And they worshiped God. And time went by a little bit, and they sort of forgot God. And they started doing their own things again instead of remembering what God's requirements were. And so they started living their own life again. And then God came down on them again. They suffered again. They would come back. And it was just a cycle. And it's a cycle in our life as well. We have a tendency to forget. Forget God, to forget His wisdom. And that's what it says. It says, get it, get wisdom, get understanding, but don't forget it. The warning's there for a reason. Because we have a tendency to forget things. I can, I can leave my bedroom saying, okay, I'm going to go take the trash out. And there are times when I get there, something distracts me, and I forget that I actually wanted to do that, and I end up not doing it. <laughs> and if I'm going to forget little things like that, you know, just think about the, the, the big deal with God's Word. It needs to be preeminent in our life and have primacy and take first place in our life. And so when we get that wisdom and get that understanding... We must work hard not to forget it. It takes effort. It takes determination. It takes motivation, if you will. So for, um, it says, uh, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. To decline means 
it literally means to stretch down and away from something, but it means don't turn aside or away from it. So don't turn aside or away from it. So we can, we can um, forget it, that is not be thoughtful of it because it wasn't important to us, right? Uh, and we took it lightly. You know, it's like the guy who went and tried to rescue the, the Ark of the Covenant when it was falling, and he thought he was a hero, keeping it from in the ground. He died on the spot because he wasn't supposed to do that. Had he retained that knowledge and had not forgotten it, he wouldn't have done that. But see, we don't think sometimes about the requirements. And some things that seem in human reasoning to be the right thing to do are the absolute wrong thing to do. Because... God's Word can't be understood by the natural mind. We have to have a spiritual mind. So only when we're saved by the grace of God can we think spiritually. But just because we think spiritually because we've been saved and we have the Word of God dwelling in us and we're trying to serve the Lord doesn't mean we're not going to forget it. It takes work. It takes effort. Don't forget it. And neither decline from the words of my mouth. The words of my mouth, again, are this good doctrine from verse 2. So don't turn away from it or turn aside from it. It's utterly important that you obey this instruction I'm giving you. So in verse 6, he says, forsake or not. So pretty much related to declining from it, it's different than forgetting it. Forgetting it means that we we haven't taken necessary precautions to remember that. But forsaking it means we just abandon it. And there are people who who hear the word of God and they just Take Ananias and Sapphira. They knew it was wrong to do what they were doing, but they did it anyway. God required their life of them. There are people who take communion without a right heart. Have, they have sins that are unconfessed. And they take it lightly. And God has killed some of those people and made them sick. So, you know, you take little things like that that don't seem like much. You know, what did Moses do? He struck the rock the second time when he was supposed to speak to it. Little thing, you say, well, sure, God, because of that, said you're not going to go into the promised land. It was a big deal to God. It seems like such a little thing to us, and we would have forgiven him and not had a second thought about it. Oh, don't worry about it. No, not God. He requires righteousness. He requires it. And we need to do it his way. So we can't can't just forsake it. We can't forget it. We can't decline from it. But if we don't forsake it and don't decline from it and don't forget it, according to verse 6, she shall preserve thee. That is, protect us. And it says, if we love her, love her, uh, and she shall keep thee. That is, to guard us. So, um, you know, I'm I'm a person that in my secular work, and I I know people, people think, think more of me than my abilities are. And I know that. And I, I, I lived my, I worked my entire career in a situation like that where God was honoring my commitment to His Word. And I'm not trying to build myself up, but what would happen is um, I, I received honor and, 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 and I guess a good reputation from people not because I was better than them, but because I honored God in my life. And what happens is God then promotes you. He gives, He lets people will honor you and regard you. And it's, it's, you don't, you know, and, and actually it's a, it's a goal and a perspective that everybody should keep in mind here. Um, and it's five and six together and, and get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget it. Don't decline from it. Don't forsake it. Um, and she shall Preserve thee, that is, protect thee, love her, and she's going to keep thee, that is, to guard you. It says, then, wisdom is the principal thing. It's wisdom. God's wisdom. And that wisdom refers back to the good doctrine in verse 2. It's the sound doctrine we studied that Paul wrote to Timothy about over in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus. He wrote in all those books. We just looked at one of them. But wisdom is the principal thing. Principal thing means it has primacy in our life. It means first place. It means preeminent above all other things. What is? Wisdom is. And when we, when we get it in verse 5, we get wisdom, get understanding. We don't forget it. Don't decline from it. Don't forsake it. We're going to be protected by it. And we love her and she's going to guard us. That wisdom is the principal thing. And in verse 7, therefore... Get wisdom. <laughs> See, it started out with get wisdom, get understanding. Don't do any of these things to, 
to, to back away from it or to forget it or disregard it. But when you do this, what happens? It says there in verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore, this is the conclusion of the matter, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. That's our goal. What does this say? Preeminent, first place. God is first place in our life. And we know God through His Word. So His Word, and so if we're going to know how to live our life to honor God and to please God, and to be the one person God wants us to be, then we have to know what the Word says. We've got to get the wisdom, get the understanding, the, the, the discretion to know between right and wrong. And as we have that discernment, we can make good decisions, make good choices, live our lives in accordance, live it according to the, God, the end of verse 4, live a life that pleases God and counts for Him. And at the end of verse 7, uh, it says, with all thy getting, get understanding. This is that discernment. So then in verse 8, after all of that, exalt her. Now, this requires going public with it. <laughs> exalt her. And she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. You see, the honor, the honor and the promotion comes from God. Not our efforts. We didn't do it to get honor and promotion. We didn't do it to get that. We did it because God requires it. We did it because that's what God expects of us. And so then, after we get it, and even we get the discernment at the end of verse 7, we're going to exalt, we're going to lift up wisdom. Wisdom's a principal thing. So in our witness to other people, it's so important to talk about that's God's word and not ours. We need people to understand that this is not what Steve says, this is what God says. And we want people to know that we're, we, we are a reflection of what God says in his word. Because we want to exalt and lift up. We want, to pro we want to promote the Word of God in our lives. Because how else are we going to do it? So exalt the wisdom. And she shall promote thee in verse 8. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Hmm. Embrace her. The idea, here's the idea, embracing. Who do you embrace in your life? I mean, with Physically. You embrace your children, you embrace your spouse, you embrace your parents, you embrace really close friends, you embrace them because you love them. It's a, it's a show of love and affection. So wisdom is to be embraced. We love wisdom. We just truly love it. We want more of it. We want more of it. And we just want to enjoy what we do receive. And we're so thankful to God for what he's given to us. We embrace it because we're so happy that God has revealed to us out of the scriptures his will and his way and the ability to get there. So sometimes we have the wrong idea about wisdom, but exalt her and embrace her. And then in verse 9, when we do that and we do it correctly, she, that is personifying wisdom as this section has, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver thee. Literally, it's going to be um, an adornment. Wisdom becomes an adornment of God's grace upon our life. For everybody to see its beauty, its value, uh, and, and its power. You know? And we want others to know. And they're going to know that as we embrace and as we retain and, and just literally um, accept God's word for what it is and totally surrender and submit to it, it's going to be that which exalts God. Uh, look at Luke 14, 33. I want to close with this verse because too many people are after the wrong thing. Um, Luke 14, 33. It says, so likewise, as Jesus speaks to, um, to his disciples here, as he speaks parables about discipleship, in verse 33 he says, as a conclusion to this passage, he says, so likewise, whosoever, 
By the way, it's the same whosoever that John 3.16 speaks to. <laughs> the ones who actually saved by the grace of God. Whosoever he is of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Uh, we forsake it all that, that wisdom becomes the principal thing. We forsake so many other things. And I'll give you, for instance, uh, some people are too busy doing other things in order to seek. And we talked about pursuing wisdom. Chapter 2, the first five verses, you know, we talked about that. Pursuing wisdom, pursuing it. Too many people aren't pursuing wisdom. They call themselves believers. And, you know, you have to forsake all. That's what it says. Whosoever he is that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Now people say, well, you know, this money's mine. I'm going to give this to the Lord. No, it's all his. <laughs> right? He just wants us to be good stewards of his, of his wealth. Good stewards of his material things. Because they're all his. They're, they don't belong to us. They belong to God. And so when we get the right perspective that it's not ours, it's God's, I need to be a good steward of it. I need to learn through the scriptures how to be a good steward of that which God has given to me. And so nothing becomes valuable to me in the sense that I value it over anything that God gives to me because the principal thing is wisdom. Everything else is in subjection to that. Wisdom's the principal thing. So, and we're talking about the, the entire uh, uh, area of scripture that is given to us. That becomes our guidebook. You know, and Paul wrote to Timothy and says, godliness with, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. That is living a godly life, being content with whatever God has given to us, no matter what state we're in, to be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That is gain. We look too many times at our possessions, our cars, our bank accounts, our investments, and this, houses, lands, and all those things as a value of our life. And the world puts a value on it and says, well, what is that person worth? And they want to look them on the internet, oh, they're worth $6 billion. Look at that. No, well, <laughs> our worth is measured in wisdom. Wisdom's a principal thing. What do we know about God? And do we retain it? And do we use it for his glory and for his honor? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you will. Father, we're so thankful for what you've given to us tonight. Uh, as you've fed us from your word and taught us the truth and the sound doctrine you have provided, Father, that, uh, that you have challenged us, that you have convicted us and convinced us of the truth and, and the way we should live our lives. And, Father, how that you've comforted us and strengthened us with your word tonight. And we pray, Father, that as we take that which we have received tonight and use it wisely for your glory, not forgetting it, but retaining it, having listened and paid attention. Father, we know that as we embrace wisdom, that we will be honored by wisdom. And we just give you praise and thanks for all that you've done here tonight and for that which you'll do in our lives as we seek to glorify you in the days ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.